All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, if you would open your uh, Bibles to the book of Philippians, chapter 2. This morning, we're going to be in verses 25 to 30. Philippians chapter 2, verses 25 to 30. The title of the sermon this morning is Ministry is Worth the Risk. Ministry is Worth the Risk. So let's read the text, open us in a word of prayer, and then we'll jump into the sermon this morning. Uh, Philippians 2, beginning in verse 25, Paul writes to the church at Philippi, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need, for he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Let's pray. Lord, we, we pray that you would embolden our faith. God, especially in times um, where there is, is risk, there is health risks, there are health risks, there are social risks, God, we risk being ostracized, uh, belittled, slandered, and maybe even our physical health or maybe even our physical safety at times may be at risk. God, I pray that you would embolden our faith to that we would um, consider it worth the risk to do the work of ministry to do the work of missions. I pray, God, that you would speak to us now through the life of Epaphroditus. In Jesus' name, amen. Every day, people all across the world make calculated decisions as to what is worth the risk. When a house is on fire, a firefighter decides whether it is worth the risk to go inside to a burning building to potentially rescue a soul. 80 firefighters are killed every year in the line of duty. A police officer, when he is called to a scene with a gunman, he decides whether it is worth the risk to put his life on the line to save others. Over 100 police officers are killed every year. An estimated 600,000 people are injured every year snowboarding and skiing. 40 of those dying. Every year, 38,000 people die in car accidents. You could bike but 700 people die from biking. The point of this is not to breed anxiety or fear. It's simply to point out that we all assume risk. We all make calculated decisions as to what in life is worth the risk. I'm wondering if Christianity is worth the risk to you. Worth it to me. Is evangelism during a pandemic worth the risk? Is having people over to our house worth the risk? What if religious discrimination breaks out in America, which is a very real possibility? Is standing for truth and biblical principles worth the risk? 
Is confronting sin worth the risk? Or is going overseas for missions worth the risk? How about simply bringing someone a financial gift and perhaps some physical needs? Is that worth risking your life? It was for Epaphroditus. It was for Epaphroditus. Last week, we we looked at Paul's most faithful and trusted disciple, Timothy. And this week, we get to another of Paul's faithful co-laborers in Christ, Epaphroditus. And what I take away from the life of Epaphroditus is this. Ministry is worth the risk. So let's look at our text. Let's look at verse 25 here. We'll work our way through the text and then I'll have exhortations to give to us at the end. Let's look at verse 25. Paul, Paul writes, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. He says, I have thought it necessary. Now, why does he write that? Because earlier Paul said he wanted to send Timothy to them uh, back to to Philippi because he says, I have no one like him. No one will be concerned for you the way that Timothy is. But he can't send Timothy because he needs to wait to see what happens to him. And so since he can't send Timothy right now, he thinks it's necessary to send someone else. Who? Epaphroditus. Who is Epaphroditus? Well, we don't know much about him. He's only mentioned twice in the New Testament here and then later in this passage, in this letter, chapter 4, verse 18. So what do we know about him? Well, we know his name. Frank mentioned names. His name is derived from the Greek god Aphrodite. His parents probably were worshipers of Aphrodite or presumably. So his name means lovely, handsome, charming. So it's possible, it's just, it's conjecture, but it's possible that he was raised in a pagan family that worshiped this God and he is a Gentile convert. He becomes a follower of Yahweh, not Aphrodite. And he's in Rome with Paul. Well, why is he in Rome? Well, we learned this in chapter four. Flip with me over to, or or maybe you don't have to flip, maybe you just type it or, or maybe it's the same page for you. Uh, Look at chapter 4, verse 14. Look at Paul writes here. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Now remember, Paul went to Macedonia on his second missionary journey. He plays a part in developing the church there. Lydia is converted. The Philippian jailer and all his household are converted. But but Paul's not a pastor, so he doesn't stay in Philippi. That's not his role. He's an itinerant missionary. He's a church planner, so he's always traveling about. And so sometimes Paul supported his own ministry. He did this at Corinth. Remember, he was a tent maker. He joined Priscilla and Aquila, who were also tent makers. And so he supports himself there. But other times, he doesn't supply his own needs. And Paul mentions this in 2 Corinthians 11, 8 and 9. Here's what he writes to Corinth there. He says, I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden any of you. For the brothers who came from Macedonia... Philippi supplied my need. Paul writes in verse 15 
of chapter four, that no church entered into partnership with him in giving and receiving except you only. Philippi was the only church that had this mutual partnership, koinonia, same word, with Paul. So the Philippian church had faithfully supplied the the needs of Paul. He says, I have received full payment. I am well supplied. I'm, I'm taken care of. And so Philippi continues to support him, but they have a problem. It's 60 AD. There's no Venmo. There's no UPS. So Epaphroditus is Venmo. Epaphroditus is UPS. So while Paul is under house arrest in Rome, Philippi had sent one of their own, Epaphroditus, and he's coming to bring gifts to Paul. Now Paul wants to send him back to Philippi. It's most likely that Epaphroditus is the one who carried this letter. I mean, we don't know that, but it's probable it's probable that Epaphroditus is the one who brings this letter with them to Philippi. And as he carries this letter back, Paul takes the time to commend Epaphroditus to the church. He gives them five commendations. He says, look at these. Number one, my brother. Two, fellow worker. Three, fellow soldier. Four, your messenger. And five, minister. Let's look at each of those briefly. Number one, my brother, Epaphroditus, my brother. This is a reminder that we are not simply fellow church members. We're not fellow church attenders or fellow servants or friends or associates. We are all of those, but we are first and foremost brothers and sisters in Christ. We have the same father. We have been adopted by this father as sons and daughters. And therefore, we relate to one another as family. This is your family, for better or for worse. Of course, you could always leave, I guess. We pray not. Two, well, they're still your family. Even if you leave, they're still your family. (laughs) Just in a different sense. Two, fellow worker. This is one of Paul's favorite titles. He gives it to uh, Priscilla and Aquila, Urbanus, Timothy, Titus, Stephanus, Fortunatus, Acacius, Yodia, Syntyche, Clement, Philemon, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, before he fell in love with the world, Luke, Justice. This is one of Paul's favorite titles for his Fellow workers, this is a reminder that none of us lives to himself, none of us dies to himself. We need fellow workers in the fight of faith. Three, fellow soldier, literally comrade in arms. Paul only calls two people by this title, Epaphroditus and Archippus and Philemon too. This is a reminder that this is a very real battle. We are in a very real war. Right now, you are in a battle. Because the word is being preached. And Satan would steal it from you if he could. We are always in a very real battle. And we need fellow soldiers to fight this war. For your messenger, in Greek, apostolos, where we get the word apostle from. He says, you're apostle. Apostle means ambassador, delegate, messenger. Now the word apostle can be used in a formal sense, like the 12 apostles, but it also can have simply the meaning of messenger. And here I think it takes the latter meaning. Messengers were highly valuable in antiquity. They were. It's the only way you could get things across. I don't know how many of you uh, saw the movie uh, 1918. The whole movie was about one man delivering one message. And and the fate of this entire uh, division of the army, all their lives depended on this one message getting through to the general. And five, minister. Just as there is a formal sense of shepherd, 
and a functional sense of shepherd. So likewise, there's a formal sense of minister and a functional sense of minister. Paul says that Epaphroditus ministered to my need. Well, what was his need? We don't know. At the minimum, it was financial need. Paul's under house arrest. He can't make any money. So Epaphroditus brings him a financial gift to supply his needs. It probably included other physical needs, maybe logistical needs as well. We don't know, but Epaphroditus ministered to his need. All right, let's look at verse 26 to 27a. He has been longing for you all. He's been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill near to death. Now, apparently Epaphroditus, either on the way to Rome or when he got to Rome, he fell ill. We don't know when, we don't know what it was or how, but he's ill, so ill that he almost died. Remember, this is 60 AD. This is almost 2,000 years ago. It was not uncommon when, when you got sick, People died. Today we get sick all the time and we take for granted we're going to recover because we have all kinds of medicines and therapies and and hospitals and doctors and we have so much access. But 2,000 years ago, it was not uncommon if you got sick. People often died. Epaphroditus clearly wanted to carry this gift to Paul, minister to his needs, and then get back to his church family. But this sickness prevented him from going back. Paul writes that Epaphroditus had been longing. He says, he's been longing to get back to you, Philippi. And what made it worse is that Epaphroditus heard that Philippi had learned that he was ill. Now, we don't know how they heard. One theory is is that on the way, maybe he got sick on the way, and someone coming the opposite way found out and took it back to Philippi. That's just a theory. Somehow they found out. And it appears that Epaphroditus, he felt distressed. He felt troubled when he learned that they learned about his sickness. Now, I admit, my first thought when I read this was the same as Karl Barth's. Karl Barth writes this, This was unusual behavior for a fully grown man, namely to worry about their worry. That's, that's what I thought, too. But this was not uncommon in their culture. This was not uncommon in their culture. When I first moved here, I learned that in Asian culture, that when people get sick, they often don't tell anybody. They don't want anybody to worry about them. Or they don't want to be a burden to others. Or they don't want others burdening them. I think it's the same idea here. He, he, he finds out that they, they found out about his sickness and now he's burdened at their burden. So Epaphroditus wants to get back quickly so that he can relieve their concern for him. Verse 27b, but God had mercy on him and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. God had mercy on Epaphroditus, meaning God healed him. God healed him. We're reminded uh, to be cautious towards two extremes here. The first extreme is the naturalist. The naturalist lives in the realm of science and medicine. But even our medical and scientific advancements are the mercy of God. The other extreme is the charismatic healer. Paul had the gift of healing. Even aprons that he touched healed people. Paul has the gift of healing. So you want to say, well, look, if you got the gift of healing, just heal Epaphroditus. But we are reminded that all gifts, just like the gift of healing, do not come on demand. It was not on demand. All healing is ultimately the mercy of God. Not only did God have mercy upon Epaphroditus, but he also had mercy upon Paul. Paul says he had mercy on me. How so? Paul writes, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Why would Paul have sorrow upon sorrow? He could mean one of two things. Number one, he could mean, well, I already have sorrow because I'm in prison under house arrest in Rome. And if Epaphrodite dies, that's only going to add to my sorrow. Or he could mean, if Epaphrodite dies, number one, I will be losing a, a brother, a fellow worker, a fellow soldier, 
But not only will I be losing him, I will lose him in the ministry to me. Maybe some, he feels like somewhat it would be his fault to some degree that Epaphroditus died serving him. And of course that would create sorrow upon sorrow. We don't know what Paul means by that. Either way, God had mercy upon Epaphroditus and God had mercy upon Paul. Let's look at verse 28. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, that I may be less anxious. Paul is is eager to send Epaphroditus back to Philippi for two reasons. Number one, that you may rejoice at seeing him again. Surely this church would rejoice at seeing this fellow brother come back. And once they found out that he almost died, of their, how much more would they rejoice that God spared him and had mercy and now he's, they're glad to have him back. And two, Paul says, that I may be less anxious. Now that's probably better translated less sorrowful. I don't know why the ESV translates it anxious. That I may be less sorrowful. Here, Paul is looking not only to his own interest, but the interest of others, just as he had written earlier. I'm sure he would have liked for Epaphroditus to stay with him. I mean, if you're under house arrest in Rome, surely you want company. He has Timothy. I'm sure it wouldn't hurt to have Epaphroditus too. And so he could be selfish and say, Epaphroditus, stay with me. But he says, no, he looks not only to his own interest, but the interest of others. He says, it is good. You need to go back to Philippi. They need you more. I need you to, maybe he was a leader in the church. We don't know but he wants to send Epaphroditus back to Philippi. And he's looking out for Epaphroditus' interest and Philippi's interest. Look at verse 29. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Therefore, receive him in the Lord. What does that mean? This is similar to Paul's instructions to the Romans. In Romans 16, 1 to 2, Paul writes, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Centurea, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. Paul exhorts the Philippians to give a hearty welcome to Epaphroditus when he comes back. A joyful welcome. He doesn't want the church to think that Epaphroditus cut his mission short. Maybe if he comes back and they think, you know, hey, you didn't fulfill your ministry. He doesn't want them to think this. He wants them to understand it was I who sent him back. Church, I sent Epaphroditus back to you. And Paul exhorts them, honor such men, which may not carry the full force of the Greek word used here. The NASB says, hold such men in high regard. So it's even like a higher level than honor. Why does Paul instruct them to honor Epaphroditus? Or perhaps he wants the Philippian church to know just what he risks. It's possible that Epaphroditus, when he gets back, he may minimize the severity of his illness. You know how people sometimes they minimize things? I've... Sometimes I hear people have cancer and they're like, oh, I'm fine. You're not fine. You have cancer. Epaphroditus might minimize the severity of his illness. And so Paul wants them to know, listen, this brother, this was a serious sickness. He he was knocking on death's door. He almost died. He is worthy of honor. He is worthy of you honoring him. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. For he nearly died, risking his life. Again, this is almost 2,000 years ago. There's no vaccines, there's no x rays. There's no antibiotics. There's no transplants. There's no antiviral drugs. 
Anytime that you traveled in antiquity, you were putting your life at risk. Every time you traveled 2,000 years ago, you were putting your life at risk. Epaphroditus knew this when he set out for the journey. It's not as though he was naive. He knew that to travel to Rome put his life at risk. Notice what he calls the Epaphroditus' gift, the work of Christ. Look at it. He nearly died for the work of Christ. Now, now, now notice Epaphroditus, he's not going to Rome to lead a spiritual revival. He's coming to bring gifts to one man. And yet Paul calls it the work of Christ to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Now, the way that ESV translates that, it sounds like a mild rebuke by Paul. ESV doesn't translate it the best. I think the NIV smooths this out a little better. NIV's translation, risking his life to make up for the help that you could not give me. Paul wrote in chapter four, verse 10, that I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now we don't know why the church had no opportunity, but for one reason or another, they had no opportunity to help Paul, to send gifts to Paul. But now Epaphroditus has provided that opportunity. Finally, the church is able to send this financial gift and these these needs to meet the, the needs of the Apostle Paul. And Epaphroditus is the means. If he doesn't go, there's no needs being met. Epaphroditus has become the hands and feet of Philippi. The hands and feet of Christ. All right. We'll stop there in our text. Seven exhortations. These are seven exhortations from the life of Epaphroditus. Here they are. Number one, blood may be thicker than water, but spirit is thicker than blood. Blood is thicker than water is a medieval proverb. You may have heard it before. It's to suggest that familial ties will always supersede our friendships or business relationships. Family comes first. It's kind of the idea. And while that may be true in most scenarios, there is one that it is not. The family of God. Blood may be thicker than water, but spirit is thicker than blood. This family, this family, and all the family of Christ has deeper ties in one sense than even our biological families. One day they came to Jesus and they said to him, Jesus, your your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And Jesus said to them, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Now, why do I point this out? Because I desire that we would not see this family as secondary or supplemental. My desire is that we would not see this church family as secondary to your biological family or supplemental to your biological family. I pray that when you think about the people sitting under this awning and even those who are not here this morning, That it's not just an idea that they're your brothers and sisters. When you call each other brothers and sisters, it's not just an idea. It's not just a a cute idea. It's a reality. It's an eternal reality. It's actually the only eternal reality. 
You will only spend eternity with the family of God. Now, praise God if that happens to also be your biological family. Blood may be thicker than water, but spirit is thicker than blood. Two, we are worker bees, not queen bees. Paul calls Epaphroditus his fellow worker. Now keep in mind, Paul was an apostle. He wrote a majority of the New Testament. He said that he, he worked harder than all of them. And yet Paul calls Epaphroditus, this man that we hardly know anything about, he calls him his fellow worker, which means Paul too is a fellow worker. This is the argument that Paul is making in 1 Corinthians 3. Remember in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted Apollos water, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything at all, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one. Each will receive his wages according to his labor. And here it is. For we are God's fellow workers. Now there's two ways we could think about that. Both would be correct. Number one, neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. We are simply workers. We are servants. We are slaves. We are a footnote on one page of one book among all the libraries of the history of the world. That's our legacy. We are a footnote. And two, we are God's fellow workers. God lets us work for him. We work for almighty God. Amen. Three. We are infantry, not snipers. Paul writes that Epaphroditus was a fellow soldier, a comrade in arms. In Christianity, there is no army of one. There are no snipers. Snipers always work alone. That's not how Christianity works. We are down in the trenches. Shoulder to shoulder with our brothers and sisters. Paul tells Timothy, wage the good warfare. He talks about the weapons of this warfare. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Fight the good fight of the faith. And the weapons that God gives us is not simply the theological sniper precision that we work out in our ivory towers. No, the weapons that God gives us is often each other. One another. Down in the trenches of battle. This is why Paul tells Timothy, share in suffering, Timothy. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Epaphroditus was in Rome sharing in Paul's suffering. I want to exhort you, brothers and sisters, get down in the trenches. Get into the mud. Yes, most people's lives are in the mud. You want to get involved in someone's life? It's dirty. It's confusing. It's difficult. It's messy. That's where the battle is. Most of us, all of us are in the mud. Get down into the mud with your brothers and sisters. Get into their life. If they say that you're invading their space, yes, I'm invading your space. I love you. Stand side to side with them. Fight for them. Fight with them. 
Go to battle with your brothers and sisters. Go to battle for your brothers and sisters. Go to battle for the lost in your life who may be taking shots at you. When you share the gospel with the lost, yeah, they're going to take shots at you. Go to battle for them. Four, we don't have to be a minister to minister. You may be thinking, well, like, I thought that was your job, Matt. We don't have to be a minister to minister. Paul said that Epaphroditus was a minister to his need. Now, we don't know exactly what Epaphroditus did. At the bare minimum, he brought a financial gift. But in reading this passage, it appears that he did more than this. Perhaps he tended to Paul's physical needs. Perhaps he tended to his medical needs. Maybe he went and bought food for Paul. Made him some soup. Maybe he helped him write letters. Maybe he sang songs to him. Maybe Epaphroditus was gifted musically. What a joy. Can you imagine like having no music at all? And then having somebody come who can like sing? That would be amazing. We don't know. What we do know is that Epaphroditus ministered to the Apostle Paul in a very precarious time in his life. You don't have to be a minister to minister. Sometimes it's the simplest things that minister the most. There are days where I'm sitting in my office and I am barely holding it together emotionally. And my son Ezra will come in and hand me a picture that he drew for me. And it ministers to me. It ministers profoundly to me. Sometimes it is the simplest things that minister the most. Five, give honor where honor is due. Paul instructs the Philippians to honor such men. Probably better translated, to highly honor or to highly regard. We are living in a culture where there's not a lot of honor going around, is there? There's a lot of shame going around. There's a lot of condemnation going around on both sides. And yet as Christians, we are called to live a life of honor. Honor. We are told to honor our father and mother. Honor the son. Honor God. Outdo one another in showing honor. Pay honor to whom honor is owed. Esteem very highly those who are over us in the Lord. Honor widows. Bond servants are to honor their masters. Honor everyone, including the emperor. Husbands, honor your wives. It's not as though Epaphroditus led this great awakening. It's not as though he preached a sermon in Rome and 3,000 people were saved. It's not as though he went to Rome and he planted 50 churches. He simply carried out this very simple task of bringing a financial gift and maybe some physical needs to Paul. And Paul says he is worthy of honor. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. Six, a cup of cold water is the work of Christ. Look at Paul says in verse 30. He nearly died for the work of Christ. Epaphroditus was one man going to one city, bringing one gift to one man. And yet Paul calls it the work of Christ. Jesus said, whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, I truly, I tell you, he will by no means lose his reward. 
Epaphroditus will by no means lose his reward. Truly I say to you, as you did it unto the least of these, my brothers, you did it unto me. Now certainly we don't want to stop at giving a cup of cold water. God has called us to primarily give cups of living water. But don't let that minimize what Epaphroditus does. Paul calls it the work of Christ. Often in our darkest seasons, we feel the warm embrace of our Savior through one another. When you are discouraged and you are down and a brother or sister brings you a bowl of soup or a bubble tea or a handwritten note, it's in those moments you feel the warm embrace of your Savior through your brother and sister. And seven, last point. Ministry is worth the risk. Ministry is worth the risk. Now, let me go on a quick clarification trip. I'm sure some of you wanted me to give this at the beginning. I am not making a case for folly or foolishness or arrogance. There is a difference. There is a massive difference between a calculated risk and folly. Jumping out of an airplane with a parachute is a calculated risk. Jumping out of an airplane without a parachute is folly. I'd probably argue that it, even with a parachute, it's folly. There is a difference between taking a calculated risk and folly. There is a difference between a calculated risk and arrogance. What I learned from Epaphroditus is that ministry is worth the risk. I am perplexed as to why so, for so many Christians, ministry is not worth the risk. Why is that? Every time someone traveled in the ancient world, it was risky. People died all the time. Every time a woman had a child in the ancient world, it was risky. One of the predominant killers of women in the ancient world was childbearing. To share the gospel at all in the first 300 years of Christianity was enormously risky. Even this week, I was talking to my wife about the sermon and she was sharing with me a story about Eric Little, uh, Olympic runner turned missionary to China. And he, would, he volunteered to carry messages back and forth, correspondence, and, and risked his life just to carry messages, just to get the, the message from one place to another. That's it. And he risked his life for this. Three times in this passage, Paul reminds the Philippians that Epaphroditus almost died. Indeed, he was near death. He was ill and near death for he nearly died risking his life. Consider Epaphroditus. He's not risking his life to go save an entire population. He's not going to like the whole, he's got a vaccine. He's bringing it to Rome. All of Rome is dependent on him. And he's like, okay, I can do this. He risked his life to simply bring a gift to Paul. That's it. The question is not, is ministry a risk? Paul said he was often near death. Imagine living in such a way where you're often near death. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three. 23. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. For your sake, we are being killed all the day long. And even when they tried to tell Paul, don't go to Jerusalem, 
You're going to die there. Don't go, Paul. Paul said, I am ready to not only be imprisoned, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. The question is not, is ministry a risk? The question is, is it worth it to you and to me? We're in the middle of a pandemic right now. You have been for eight plus months. We don't know what the future holds. If we are to be in this situation for another three months, six months, 12 months, 24 months, will we take wise, calculated risks? Will we take wise, calculated risks? We may experience greater religious pressure and squeezing, maybe even persecution in the coming years. We don't know what the future holds. Will we take wise, calculated risks? I pray that all of us will make up our minds today, choose today, that we will decide by the power of the Spirit and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father that ministry is worth the risk. Let's pray.